understand what show is always a mystery right up this left. I don't think I can hear you. We like the mic up. You're on your stand closer to the microphone. Speak into the microphone. All right. Okay, well, yeah, this is going to get interesting. Okay, the table will be closer. We never know how this is going to happen until the very last minute. And it was my idea that we would actually have a nice office in a very small room. That we would have a camera on one side and the audience would have like maybe some wireless mic to ask audience questions because that's what we do on the show. We normally take live calls, we're not going to be broadcasting live here. We like to discuss with, rather like uh, you know, Matt does on his show, we like to bring in living opinions and various people's questions of what uh, points or concerns they want to bring up. In this show, the context of the theme of this event, I would understood to be that we are toward the end of the world, one way or another, with uh, either the Mayan calendar or the imminent elections. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, people want to bring up concerns about that. There's, there's all kinds of things that people will bring up on the show often by surprise. And we try to have, when we first started doing these shows, we try to have a diverse field of people that have some specialty in various types of scientific applications that would adequately answer these questions. Um, this evening I have beside me P.C. Myers of Gringo, uh, who will have, have to stand in as our, our guest time this evening. He's been on one of those ones before in Ireland. Uh, it was my honor to have him on that and now. And that's uh, someone you may not recognize because he doesn't have a dinosaur head at the moment. <laughs> and that is our other regular co host, uh, this is Concordance. And if I use only his Concordance? Yes. <laughs> Because he's all about anonymity and he couldn't afford a dinosaur because it didn't look ridiculous yeah. in the shop. I tried. <laughs> okay, so I don't know how we're going to do questions. We were going to have a wireless mic. Is that mobile? That's mobile. We also have one over here we'll pass around. Okay, good. Um, do we have somebody that can run? Okay. No. <laughs> okay, well, that's going to be a little awkward, I think. I need a runner. Do you need a runner? Yeah, there's a couple people. Yeah, yeah. We, we got a volunteer to, to run that run that wireless point. That'd be great. We would love to just converse with the audience because you guys will come up with ideas that we wouldn't turn on. So, all right. To open with, does anybody have any opening comments from the panel? From the panel, you expect yeah. us to just say something? Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, gee, you know, this is probably a fairly uniform group of people. Atheists don't have differences of opinion. It's really <laughs> difficult to get provocative questions, but try. <laughs> Can, how many of you have seen the Magic Sandwich show before on one of, one of our many outlets? All right, so there are a number of you that, that have probably never seen the show before. It is uh, both a science show, an atheist show, um, and we managed to integrate both of those depending on the discussion and the content. It is a call-in show, uh, and some of us are very scientifically motivated. Some of us consider ourselves more skeptical than atheists. Um, but it's a, it's a fixed panel. Some of you may know from the YouTube community, uh, DPR Jones, Thunderfoot, uh, Aaron, and myself are, are fairly regular panelists. All right, so let's open up with questions from the audience if there are any. Any hands up? Oh, look. That is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll start off with a contentious question. With a contentious, contentious question. Contentious, oh, no. Gary. Okay. Is there a God? No. Is there a God? Just recently, there was a uh, YouTube video by King Gordon uh, talking about P.V. Myers. Uh, no, there cutting, off, off, <laughs> <laughs> uh, cutting off um, comments on, on the YouTube channel, and I noticed that you two are not uh, beating each other up. Could We're at different tables. I mean, that should <laughs> that should have been a tip <laughs> off. I was wondering, uh, could, could you talk about how you're not beating each other up when you're obviously, according to the internet, you're supposed to be hitting each other up. Well, it's really good to know. I, mean, I, I tend to be rather vociferous and vocal in what I say, right? But that doesn't change the fact that I can respect what Concordance does and I can respect his opinion. I just disagree with it. I disagree very strongly with it. And uh, so, no, I, 
I kind of like the idea of somebody coming up and trying to give me a reasoned argument, even if it just for the wishes is, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You know, we're, we're coming in from different angles, and so it's, it's, I think it's very useful to hear those different perspectives. I think there is tension between different communities in atheism. There are a lot of subdivisions within atheism, each of them with a slightly differing perspective. So in the case of YouTube atheism, we, I think, have a very outreach-focused message. We, we go on social media that are open to non-atheists, that are not focused on atheism, not focused on skeptical thinking, and we try to take the message out to a very broad audience. Sites like Feringula are all about keeping the atheist community together. They're all about uh, celebrating the core values that we share, uh, the, the values, I think, that are, are shared, things like social justice uh, and also critical thinking. But it's more about the internal community. So my, my thinking, my, my complaint about closing off uh, PZ's video was simply that it created a, a dead spot in our community where that engagement was not happening. It was not an effective way for outreach to occur to non-atheists. In retrospect, I think PZ's use of YouTube has really nothing to do with outreach to non-atheists, you know, appealing to the theist or appealing to the creationist or advancing an argument in that forum. So that's the, I think, the origin of the dispute, and I think we actually had a very brief conversation outside, uh, and we just agreed that that really was the source of disagreement, was that he didn't really, PZ doesn't really need YouTube as an outlet for outreach. It's much more about mirroring his material. Well, let me, let me disagree. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't think that's it at all. I think Frankie is also a tool for outreach. It's a, it's a different kind of outreach. Um, if you read Fredo Threads at all, you discover that it is non-stop warfare on the community of people arguing constantly with one another. And we actually invite and encourage outsiders to come in and, well, we call them chew toys. But, you know, you can get more than come in and not engage. Uh, so that, that's, not, that's not the reason why I shut down comments on YouTube, is because Comments on YouTube are idiotic, right? <laughs> this is, this is, the, whole, the whole problem is in the system where it's, it's not that I wouldn't welcome those same people coming over to my site and arguing with me. I, I would love it if more of them come over and get into a good argument with me. But what I find in YouTube is a lack of argument, that there's more shouting and yelling, and, and what I found incredibly tedious was the repetition. That there there are a few little memes that got caught in, for instance, other sites uh, that they would just come over and just parrot those at me endlessly and I found absolutely no productive use in listening to them. And also the other problem I have is it's it's an open forum, sure, which is which is nice in principle, but when you've got an open forum with no accountability where there's no continuity in most of the commenters, that they are just anonymously shrieking at you. Uh, you are not contributing to the quality of the discourse by allowing that. That good conversation requires some limitations on what people can say and do. We know that in the classroom, right? when, I, when, I, when I run a class or a meeting like this, uh, we don't say, Okay, everyone start yelling at me your disagreements, your agreements, which questions. No, what we do is we say, okay, take turns, right? There are basic rules on like that. And then YouTube lacks that sort of thing. It's, it's a very uncivilized, and I find very unproductive method of carrying on outreach. But, of course, these YouTubers, I have a lot of number of people disagree with. <laughs> and of course I do. Um, my first meeting with PZ was confrontational. I, my first meeting with Lawrence Krauss was an argument. Uh, I, 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 would, I would have loved when I walked into that, that podcast with Pendula and pissed off, saw me as Chris and she stormed out of the room. 
I didn't know you'd take over her chair and resume her argument for her. I would love to have done that. What a great thing to be able to argue with Angela. And, <laughs> but you know, see, these are people that, that I respect on a number of points. I'm never going to agree with everybody on every point, and it's important that we be able to argue certain things. And there's a lot of things that I, that I disagree with practically everybody about. Everybody that I respect, I have a disagreement with. And we have another question over there. Uh, perhaps an ignorant question, but I'm encouraged by the fact that half the room was with me when they didn't raise their hands uh, in response to who has seen or heard the Magic Sandwich show before. So, fairly simple. Why that title? There's got to be an interesting story there somewhere. I haven't heard it. And there is. Yeah, there is. Uh, <laughs> the, one, the one member of our cast who has never been on any of the live performances managed to skirt that because he got his doctorate and began his practice in the Bahamas, where he was obviously too busy to play the bus anymore. <laughs> and more he, he's a dentist, I think that should be mentioned, in the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> so, this guy um, uh, came up with a brilliant argument against a, a, a young younger creation whose career in idiocy ended with this argument that he brought up. Um, the, what do you come up with was the thing about the magic sandwich. If you eat the magic sandwich, the magic sandwich will cure your cancer. And if you don't eat the magic sandwich, you're going to have cancer. You have to have faith in the magic sandwich. And there, there are certain things about the ingredients and all kinds of ridiculous excuses about how it could be tested. You had to argue on faith. And he had this boy twisted around to where the boy was arguing all of our arguments against God. And you could count the arguments that he's in the freedom of the Sheer brilliance. I can't repeat it now. You have to look it up. But just listening to it was was astounding. But he did all of this on the fly on a Skype call and it made a video. And it was so inspired that we had to take the name of the show from that. Yes. Yeah, I think we all know what's at stake for the presidential election. But the state board of education, all the seats are up for election this. This round, can you tell us what exactly is at stake with the State Board of Education here in the election this year? Texas no longer has the level of influence that it once did. The reason that the, the earlier Texas Board of Education was erected the way that it was was to set up a voting block deliberately because other states would end up buying whatever Texas mandated because Texas bought such a large percentage of the textbooks in other states, well, the publishers would want to run one run for the benefit of saving money. In the computer age that we have now, it's not possible to do individual printings for every state. And uh, Texas and California no longer have the books that they do. Texas no longer has, has the money that it had. So we don't need to worry about that kind of corruption and people being used for that purpose anymore. Plus, the old Board of Education was such an international embarrassment on such a widespread public scale that that will be attended again, I think, like any state. It certainly isn't going to happen here. In the previous elections, we had already established that the Board of Education, the people that were still on that original voting block that had the agenda that they were supposed to vote for along party lines, they were already losing out. They had to let it go. They had to vote for signs because all the cards were stacked against them, and they knew that. And some of the seats had already been replaced. Progress had already been made a year ago, uh, a year or two ago, and now I forget. So it, it is advancing. So that's, that's, a, that's a year of past, I hope. Can I add one real quick thing first? Um, I, I think one of the things at stake is the future of science in Texas. Um, if, if we do have, and, and it has a trickle-out effect to the rest of the nation, but within Texas, our reputation as a center for science and research is always at stake when the media covers some discussion of some yokel, some dentist, for example, in College Station, uh, who, who feels he needs to stand up to the experts. The world judges us on that kind of performance. And when a biotech company, like the one that I work for, makes a decision about putting in manufacturing, putting in research labs, they really are subtly affected by the kind of perception of the environment that a scientific or research institution would be uh, facing when they come to Texas. What kind of local talent we have. Now we have a first class university system. We have two 
first class university systems in the state. So we have the resources. What we don't have is good PR. So I think that might be one of the most direct costs is Texas is perceived as uh, a science unfriendly state. Well, I might have to second that. You know, as the non-Texan on the panel, um, you know, I'm from way from Northern Yankee Lane in Minnesota. And, you know, well, yeah, I'm good to know. No, anyway. Uh, yeah, when I, when I go to the talks locally, when I go to our local school board, and all I got to say is, do you want to be like Texas? And you can back home. I do a lot of international travel. I go to travel abroad and I give talks on creation and things like that. And seriously, Texas is a laugh line. Really, it's this state has become a joke. And yeah, I know Concordance is exactly right. There are some phenomenal universities here. I have a number of researchers here who are brilliant and who are doing great things. But below that upper echelon of really top level university people, Texas has a dismal reputation. I hope you can fix it. Um, I would also add that um, when you're talking about the Board of Education things, that these are things we ought to be doing. The religious right has known this for 50 years. This is what they've been doing for 50 years, is they knew that their ideas were a little bit on the wacky side. So in 1960s, running for presidency with the baggage of a 6,000 year old earth was impossible, but you could run for school board. You could pack school boards, you could pack city councils, you could work on building up the state legislatures. Yes, Texas state legislatures are also another level. Uh, but you could pack these places, and then all of a sudden you could have a platform so that here in the 21st century, we have a nation where people can seriously run for president on a whole set of bullshit ideas like the theory of the 6,000 years old and evolution and focus. You can't do that anywhere else, but you can do it here because they have done the groundwork and built that foundation to make it credible. And we need to do that. That means forget about the trying the big splashy, let's get an Indian president. We should be saying we want an Indian city council. Work for that. So. And here's the way it is. What they end up having to do, the only way that they can win is winning the debate in the empty chair. And what I'm looking at, what I'm looking at with the growth of the secular movement with the nuns, with the, with the rise of atheism in America, that what they are arguing with is the empty chairs within their own churches. And there's more and more of them all the time. So there's progress being made there. Yeah. On the subject of politics, one of the things that I contend is you see a lot of the discussion, for example, in the previous thing that Romney brought up the issues of you know, wanting to say that it should be controlled at the state level. And to me, it seems like the biggest reason for that argument is the state level is more easily corrupted, as y'all been highlighting. But part of that corruption seems to me to be the relative lack of light in the media as a whole on state politicians, state level things. I mean, even if you're interested in the matter, finding out about what's actually going on at your state and city council level takes your average citizen a pretty significant amount of effort to actually find out what happens. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if y'all had, you know, run across things like that or we're starting to see organizations that were starting to want to shed light. I mean, it seems to me that given the amount of media that we have today, that I would think that these areas would not be as dark as they actually are. And I'm surprised that people don't get the attention that they do when they make completely backward statements. I mean, my son had brought to me a number of instances where the teachers of his classroom had told him, uh, you know, creationist things, you know, things that, that they know don't make sense, you know, and I mentioned these in other talks. But I am somehow prohibited from taking these people on. It's like the, the, the media isn't interested when it's someone expressing their religious belief, even when they are contradicting their own textbooks that they are paid to be teaching from. 
And then I get an awful lot of backfilling. And so far, since I've, since I've been in the position of Texas State Director for American Angus, I haven't had an opportunity to take anybody to court for any of these kinds of infractions. It's all a lot of backpedaling and, oh, I was just kidding, and, and so on, that's fine. When you're talking about people who want to take it to the state level, it's because they're trying to, they're trying to feign that they're not changing things at the federal level, so that they can allow the states to allow all kinds of contradictions into them among themselves, which then visits back on the federal level so that the, federal, the federation has no power. And this, and this way they can play both sides. And if anybody hasn't noticed, Mitt Romney really likes to play both sides. I really do blame the media that the media has done an incredibly bad job of reporting on issues. If you turn on your television right now, and when you look at what's going on, what you find is, first of all, the presidential election has sucked all the air out of the room. Nobody is talking about lower level candidates. Nobody's talking about unity. Yeah, issues actually being brought to the It's all the horse race. And that's the other part, is look at the presidential coverage, and it's not, oh, this, this person has this policy, this person has this policy. It's always, constantly, the horse race aspect. Who's ahead in the poll? What are the next polls saying? And it's, it's like we're supposed to just watch these polls and say, well, whoever's going to win in the polls is the one who's going to And that's no way to base a reasonable decision about an important political issue. I, um, I just uh, wanted to say, you, know, you mentioned that, uh, that we do appear to be winning. But I want to emphasize that we cannot allow that to encourage us to become complacent. We have to keep fighting. The other side is fighting hard. And if we allow ourselves to become complacent, we can still lose this thing. So it's, you know, as Jessica Alvarez pointed out this morning, there are still places where there are, people, there are atheists who are afraid to be open about it because uh, they're afraid of backlash from their community. So I just want to encourage everyone, you know, do something. Even if it's something as simple as putting a flying spaghetti monster emblem on the back of your car, uh, you know, to let your atheist neighbors know that they're not alone. Do something. Be active in some way. And don't don't uh, don't stop fighting just because we're winning this thing. And And if they get to do this while claiming a great amount of political power and influence at the same time, they don't want to give this up. And a lot of those people who aren't getting financial benefits out of this are getting a great deal of emotional support by being able to pretend that they are the reason the universe exists and that they will never die. And a whole lot of other imagined things. And they need to hold on to these with a great deal of emotional need that isn't doing this any practical benefit at all. And there's nothing that we can teach children for this. And what I can't remember who mentioned it, somebody mentioned truth, I think it was Matt, or somebody mentioned the truth was the foremost. That was me. That oh, was you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, that was the statement that got me. Was it all that really matters about what we teach is whether or not you can show that it is true. And if you can't show that it is true, then it means that it might be true. It may as well not be. And it's that, it's that, philosophy of skeptical thinking, when you can grab them down when people say, well, you can't prove that it isn't that way. Well, it needs to be focused on what can you prove, what really is correct, and what we don't really know. And if you can't show it, and you don't know it, and you can't honestly claim that you do. And when we threaten people with that, we hold them accountable, and creationism won't be, and religion, to a large degree, won't be. And the only reason we're making any effect at all is because of that grassroots attack of that philosophy that, that it appears to it appears true. And we are seeing expositions of, of uh, hypocrisy in the way. Yes? Uh, 
So um, I think that the focus on the election is fantastic, and I'm glad that everybody is kind of speaking at that level. But I think as atheists, um, there's a lot of negativity that comes because a lot of what we think they do is combating people's perceptions and bringing them towards logic and truth. But is there a positive way? Is there a platform or candidates or something that we can point to and say, not only are we rebutting things and, and kind of dissuading people from their illogical, deeply held ideas, but we're also putting something forward and making a positive change or have candidates that we're supporting or anything like that? Go ahead. I know. I know what you want to say, though. <laughs> Don't get touch that. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I, I would say that we do. We do have positive things we promote. Um, that what atheist candidates don't do is they don't go running for office. They don't get up in front of people and say, "Oh, we all have to be atheists. Reject God. We're done." No. What they're saying is that as atheists, we rely on reason and evidence. And so when we, when we have a problem, we say, okay, the proper answer to this problem is to do the research, to search out alternatives, to look for solutions in the real world, not get down on our knees and pray. And I, I think emphasizing that real world practicality of science and technology, that's, that's our domain. We own that, okay? That's the easiest way. And that's what we have to, uh, we have to more strongly make that connection in people's minds, is, oh yeah, the nerds, they're the ones that do the science stuff. And also use that to reject this silly notion of God. While atheist activists often talk about the importance of truth, that um, it is true that there are a lot more atheists in the world than have come forward to call themselves this, and I think many of them are probably worse than dishonest. I think that many, very many atheists are in the clergy and using that as a means of making money and voting power. And I, you know, when people say that they don't think that Obama is really a Christian and he's lying about Christian being a Christian so he can, so he can be a president and so he can be elected, I don't think Obama is the one that's lying about his atheism. I think Romney. Okay, I, I, got, I got to disagree with one thing there. Okay, uh, I'm going to disagree with you because I, I think you're a little bit unfair. I, I think the majority of those people who are in the clergy and who have lost faith in God are not sticking with it to split people. They're sticking with it because they see themselves as actually helping people. And they recognize that coming out and, and Rejecting cherished beliefs is going to hurt a lot of people, you know, people close to them, people in the congregation. So I, I assign a more charitable reason for this. But I still agree they should get over it. While you and I both know people in the clergy project, we both know that there are good hearted people who are in there for a number of reasons. We also know that there are very, very, very powerful evangelicals who cannot possibly believe what they did so much. You don't think Benny Hill is? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the one in Tulsa, Oklahoma, no way. Right. Right. There's, there's absolutely no way that guy would leave the stuff he was out. Right. Well, yeah, and I agree. There's there's a number of a very prominent televangelists who I agree with you. But I, I say, well, you are dealing with you know, the people in the small churches around right here who are intelligent, educated, and have been thinking about God for all of their lives, who have drifted away from belief. Um, I, I don't think most of them are there because they're getting rich at this. They're there because this is all they know how to do, and this is what they, they, they really feel that you know, providing that psychological and social counsel to the community is important. And there are people who believe that if we have said it, this be many times that whether you believe something matters more than whether it is true. There are people who hold that the belief itself somehow affords some sort of benefit in the way that people behave for the people about themselves. I don't personally share that opinion. I think that the only practical application or the only accurate information has practical application. So what I need to know needs to be verifiably accurate to some degree. And I'm done with that subject. And, and I will admit, more cynical than I am. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, 
Yeah, you know, we feel pretty good about these uh, poll numbers coming up. There was a time previously uh, in the 1880s, 1890, when Robert Ingersoll was traveling. A lot of people didn't know that Robert Ingersoll actually traveled to Texas and gave some speeches around some of the cities here. Uh, it was George Santiana, uh, a free thinker type, uh, who said, if we don't learn from our history, we're doomed to be hit. And so we should listen to that free thinker. Uh, there are some things that went wrong. When Robert Ingersoll died, it was like the free thought movement itself kind of died. I mean, we've got Richard Dawkins, Susan Berry, and, and uh, a few others who are uh, well known that if, if they're gone, you know, some of the rest of us need to pick up that slack. And uh, one of the things that, you know, in my research, I've been you know, focusing on history of pre thought atheism. And one of the things I found that happened you know, was in the newsletters here in Texas, there was a newsletter out of uh, Waco called the, uh, the Independent Pulpit. And they got to arguing about the, the silver standard. You know, the same, you know, and, and there's some, some of the political things that we're, we find ourselves arguing about and, and possibly dividing ourselves about are, are the same sort of um, non-issues that we could easily put aside and focus on our, our concerns that are mutual, that would be beneficial to everybody. And, um, one of the things to realize is, is the variation. You know, there's so many different ways that we can uh, promote our cause, and, and what is the, you know the sense of uh, community uh, just opposing, as opposed to you know, as a way to oppose, provide alternatives like secular health care, secular. Uh, Child care, secular, you know, Camp Quest is a, a wonderful example. Of this. And uh, so, the fringe atheist, we ought, we ought to accept there's going to be some differences of opinion. Let those differences go. Let's focus on you know, the separation of state and church, the rights of people to disagree. And uh, that's it. As a community, we are not without our little conflicts, and there's been a great deal of inviting and we have all our little controversies and all this. Uh, and I, I, I support what you're saying. I mean, we have a common enemy, we have a common goal. And it's not that hard for us to focus on that and let you work in fighting the trivialities that don't really matter. Um, I, as I said, I, I have uh, opposition on certain opinions with certain people. I don't know. Completely, almost completely politically opposed to uh, Ayn Rand and to Pendulet for different reasons. And, you know, I respect what they're doing that, that helps me make my goal. And that's what I focus on. So I, you know, I support the state. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and here's the problem. That, that this has always happened. People will come along and say, oh, well, you're dividing the movement that they're focusing on trivial issues. Uh, what are those trivial issues? That kind of crucial question, because what may be trivial to one person may be of paramount importance to another one. So for instance, right now, there are big internet battles going on because some of us atheists are saying feminism is kind of important. And at the same time, there's a group of people saying, I know it's not, which, to which I was saying, okay, I agree completely that there's a lot of diverse issues under the umbrella of atheism, and I would say 100% of you that feminism, for instance, or the silver standard, or whatever thing you want to pick, is not the whole of atheism. But 
what we have to do is recognize that different individuals, different subgroups in the atheist movement, will prioritize different issues. And that we should respect the people within atheism who are fighting for women's rights, who are fighting for minorities' rights. You know, even if you're not going to fight that battle yourself, step back and let them do the work. Because that's, I consider that a legitimate sunset of atheism to apply rational, intellectual, godless values to social issues. And that's one example. Now, the silver standard, I thought, okay, somebody could make a case that, yes, we have to apply godless principles to economics as well. There, there's evidence in the that we can apply to that. But again, that's, that's a perfect case of, I don't know, I'm not an economics expert. And I would say, okay, you guys who care about it, we'll battle it out. I'm, I'm stuck in that fight. But that's what I'm going to do, is sort of divide our battles between the people who really care about certain principles and people who care about other principles. And a number of other people have mentioned that, that people need to get involved, right? And, and that when we lose <coughs> dogs, that we lost cases, we lost Sagan, you know, we have to find the person to replace those. Um, there, in the YouTube universe, we already have so many specialists who, who are so expert in specific fields and make wonderful educational videos, and they're holding their own criteria of, of keeping their, their level of excellence what it should be for proper education. And they are their own judges. If anybody offers a, uh, a criticism, that will be corrected because they're, they're trying to hold to this this echelon, they want to, to educate properly, right? And, and, and as you said before, you know, the, the truth matters, and the accuracy of the information matters, and we don't want to mislead people. So there's a lot of people that when any of, if any of us goes, there's five or six or seven more that are going to come in our places, and they're going to all have specialties in areas where we only have general knowledge. And but that, I'd also say that that's what this kind of conference is about. Look at it. <coughs> Three of us sitting up here in the front of the room pretending to be authorities, right? But what matters is all of you out there, the garden things, as Aaron mentioned, those YouTube people, that's all about education, it's all about teaching people, helping them learn new things, spreading the information so that it's no longer the preserves of a few isolated people at the top that got along with everybody. And that's where we think the revolution comes in, is when you all know this stuff, when this is widespread knowledge, when everybody's got an understanding of the way the universe works, then we take over. And that's when we make it. All right, come on. Do you mind? Go ahead. Uh, we, we get to, to be such a large community, and if the community does grow, there's one skill that we're all going to have to learn, and that's how to disagree with each other. If we hold the line that victory or death is our only two acceptable outcomes, there will inevitably be a schism because no one's ever going to completely win. It's never going to be a matter of converting all the minds. There's always going to be a diversity of opinions. So it's a matter of us, I think, as a community, learning how to accept that, learning to accept that we are a larger group with a number of divisions that can all come together over these commonalities and maintain the dialogue between each other without breaking off, without forcing the communication to stop, without walking away from the table, even when our most cherished beliefs are being questioned, even when our position is becoming less tenable. Mm -hmm. It's not as godlessness. 
So in the issue of pursuit of truth and accuracy, even for something historically relevant, what Richard said this morning was bullshit. How do we police our own community and our outfits against that? We, uh, we generally criticize each other, and when we have the opportunity to do the do so, we do so face-to-face. Uh, and um, during, during not only Richard's presentation, but others at other conferences, I've talked about other things that, that didn't judge from my experience around all the I or other people around me who say, uh, as, as BC did this morning, said, that's not a good, a good argument. Like, you know, that's right, but it's not a good argument. And nobody is in power. I mean, I've, I've had to do an errata video for a couple of really stupid mistakes that I've made in some of the stuff, stuff that I've publicized. I hope that, uh, in two words, and I agree that, you know, that this guy's not perfect either. And we all have differences <laughs> with, uh, with some of the things that Dawkins has said. Much, as much respect as I can. Matt, how do, we, uh, how do we maintain the truth and accuracy campaign? Mm-hmm within the realm of our own shortcomings, and is some adjustment needed to that, it's about truth, it's about truth, it's about truth, when I know that I cannot always be accurate, um, or, or I have my own deficiencies for it. Right, well then there, when, in the specific case, what you're talking about now, right, so you kind of... Oh, that's, that's one example, I we, Yeah, but we use it as an example, okay? We have somebody who's very well respected throughout the community, he says something that somebody shows to be factually incorrect. He is going to be faced with this. People, other people are going to say, you know what you said here, that's, that's wrong. But and didn't each part of the spectrum, right? We're good. Well, don't use it as an example. Yeah, but what are you using as an example? He's specific. As, as our key fundamental point, we say it's about truth, it's about accuracy. When we do that, and yet. Well, what he's asking for is specifically, what was it that Dawkins said? JFK was a papist, right? No, no. He said that JFK used Christianity to buy into the presidency or he alluded to when he was less than exemplary of those beliefs. The American living memory of the Kennedy campaign had nothing to do with his godliness or godlessness. It was his papism versus Protestantism. That was the whole political realm at that time. Um, you know, Kennedy's godly or sort of godlessness completely out of the picture. Him and Marilyn Monroe, forget it, I don't care. The historical accuracy of what he said this morning was not valid. Well, so, but if we keep saying it's all about truth and we're completely accurate and we pursue accuracy, I think, how do I do that and acknowledge that he or I or any of us will continue to be inaccurate because he's English. He didn't live in Chicago surrounded by Catholics at the time of the Kennedy campaign to see the reality of what was happening. Can we change our tone? in such a way that we are more accurate about our inaccuracies, is the question. Well, the, the, I think the question's gotten somewhat muddy. Um, well, no, because the thing is that, uh, for sure, Dawkins is a, is a highly respected figure in this movement, right? But he's not the Pope, he's not the question, and, and so I think what you're doing right now is exactly what we need to do, is, is we need to speak out. You know, that, the, the come out campaign for atheism has many levels, but one is, yeah, we call our leaders, our so-called leaders, we really have, don't have much of a hierarchy, we call them out when they when the errors, we do this publicly, we do this openly, without fear of repercussions. You know, he's, uh, Richard Dawkins will not be able to throw a thunderbolt at you. He will not be able to say, oh, you don't get to ascend in the atheist hierarchy now. He's got no power at all like that except the power of his intelligence and his persuasion. And he will listen if you say, you know, that was a bad argument. Here's why it was a bad argument, because he, he knows this. Uh, and same for the, the audience here, when you say, here's, here's a bad argument, here's why it's a bad argument. We're going to listen. You know, nobody here is going to say, oh, but Richard Dawkins said otherwise. <laughs> Therefore, we're done. Pardon. Yeah, I have to throw this into it. I mean, I made a video where you and I called Dawkins out for the reason we were Darwin's. Personally, it annoys the crap out of me. Right. So, so I, mean, I don't like his use of the word in, in a context. If you're going to, if you're going to weigh it against Lamarckian and the you other know, sort of Lamarckism, then I would understand it. I understand that context. But just anybody that accepts that evolution is a Darwinist? No. And I have specific reasons for why that doesn't work. I called Dawkins out on that point. Right? 
And I did the same thing with um, Sir David Attenborough on his, his speech about uh, Edith and what significance she had, you know, as a you know, as a fossil link in the ancestry of humanity, and I had to put in some corrections. It was just kind of embarrassing for me because it David Attenborough. Thank you. Folks. Let me let me take over. <laughs> Perfect timing, by the way. We, we, we don't want apologetics. Is that essentially what we're saying? Is we don't want um, to ever come up with an apologetic argument for our own shortcomings. We, we, sh we shouldn't have any kind of. I don't think anybody's done that. I don't think anybody's done that. Yeah. Uh, okay. you know, I was born when Kennedy was still alive. And I remember from my early childhood hearing all the controversy over the fact that he was a pope lover, a pope lover, yeah. But I think that atheists in particular, free thinkers, are very good at spotting apologetics because most of us try to live an evidence-based life. We, we try to start from an evidence-based position and derive our morals and our life standing and our attitudes from that evidence-based position as opposed to apologetics where you decide in advance that so-and-so was always right. This book is always right. And I'm going to decide that anything that it says is therefore good evidence. And anything that's not in the book is not good evidence. I think that the very nature of our questioning probably puts that as a lower probability of that. And Paul's presence here is giving me a hint. Yes, we're running, running over. Quickly. So I, I just want to add, the only thing that we have else is that as activists in the atheist movement where we do believe the truth, we do believe in the accuracy and truth of information, in that one thing alone we have something to offer. And that real knowledge works and will achieve something for somebody not dying. <laughs> One last question and one minute to answer. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? This is Trent Smith. Can you hear me? Okay. Please. My minute is starting. I'm an army officer and a social worker. Go figure that. Oh. Um, I teach critical thinking for a living to combat soldiers. And there's one thing that I'm not hearing enough of, and that is the alternate narrative. In other words, we're taught as cognitive therapists, there's the, there's the validity of an idea, and there's the utility. What I don't hear very much is the utility of alternative beliefs. We need to talk about humanism and the manifesto. We need to talk about alternate narratives. I think what we need to use the word truth or accuracy. Mm -hmm. We need to realize so much of the narrative of what we say things mean. So in other words, just to give you a final example of my last 22 seconds, if we say from the ancient stoicism, suffering reveals character, we might have to wait 2,000 years for the post-traumatic growth researchers to prove that aspect. But still, for the first 2,000 years, it was a narrative which allowed explorers, professional legionnaires, and everybody else to endure. Or there's worse things than death, is what we tell ourselves as soldiers. My question to you, gentlemen, is what about the narrative that we need to tell ourselves, be it true or not? Wow. Uh, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of things we tell ourselves to get through the day, right? And there's a lot of things we do, we do to persevere through adversity. And um, the thing is, though, that when we do that, as atheists, we should value whether they're true or not. You know, is, is that actually the case? And, and so, you know, for instance, you know, what one story that's often thrown at us is, is that religion is valuable because it helps you cope with death, which you, can, you, have, you have a narrative, an explanation for what's happened to this person you care very much about, right? But those narratives don't work for me because I, I'm valuing the evidence behind them, and there is none. So when you tell me that my my great aunt who died of cancer is now living a happy life in paradise, that provides no resolution at all for me. What about suffering? Not necessarily, but suffering itself is meaningful, and I can grow through my suffering. That's Victor Frankl, stoic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would say you better show me evidence for that because. Um, suffering is suffering, and I would rather alleviate it for everyone. What about I tell you, suffering itself is a label and a narrative. The word suffering is already an evaluation. That's another person might call it service. I think what the problem that most of us have really with 
by what scripture to be having the value for the last 2,000 years is that, so far as I can see, it just didn't. No part of the mythology that people hold to, that they cherish for whatever reason, has any value in and of itself. They can't show me where the Bible is in any way moral or anything like moral. It offers no kind of solace. It offers no promise. There's nothing to love about it. It is the most repugnant poem I have ever read in my life. And I can't understand why anyone would want to believe it, much less how anyone could. You know... In a way, utility is also a judgment. It, it's also a statement about what, what is accomplished and whether or not that has a utility. So in saying that I value, for example, the truth of a proposition higher than I say would uh, the emotional restoration, my emotional health, I think I would much prefer a bitter truth to a comforting lie. And I think that's sort of what, what has been said. But I think it, it's inherent in the question of, is there utility? The utility itself is a judgment. It's a waiting. It's just that some things don't have a truth in it. It's, it. We have to name it. And you know, right. in other words, the idea of, I'm going to act like I'm religious to be elected president is itself right. a greater good That's a good point. If you that to Kennedy or whoever. If, mm -hmm. you, if you say the greater good argument suffices, then great, go with that. But it's still a greater good argument. In other words, I'm going to pretend to be something I'm not because I'm being elected. Because when I'm elected, I can do more. I'm tracking on that. Right. We need to be honest about what that really is. Okay. Very good. Thanks, guys.